I encourage you to grab a Bible and turn in it to Matthew chapter 13 as we continue our short, short sermon series looking at three parables of Jesus. This morning we're looking at the parable of the sower found in Matthew chapter 13. And as we prepare our hearts and minds to receive God's word this morning, we go to him in prayer. First, we pray for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would calm them, give them peace, and open them to hear the words of Jesus this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Lord would speak to their hearts, encourage them, and renew them in their faith. And finally, I ask that you would pray for me that I would preach faithfully and true according to God's word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm 19 says, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So the parable of the sower is one of these convenient parables for preachers in that Jesus later on in the chapter, which was part of the gospel reading, tells us exactly what he means by it. Because if you read the gospels, there's many times where he begins speaking in parables, and his disciples go up to him and they ask him, why do you speak in parables? And he says, it's so that the people who don't like Jesus don't understand what he's talking about. And sometimes that makes me really nervous, because how many of you have ever read a parable of Jesus been a little bit confused by it, like the disciples? You're like, so what's going on here? Right? And thankfully, the disciples were as dumb as we are sometimes, and they walk up to Jesus after he tells his parables, and they go, once the crowds have gone away, because they're a little embarrassed, they're a little shy, and they go up to Jesus, and they go, that was a great sermon. Love it, right? Like you do to me after services, you shake my hand, you tell me that's a great sermon, and you walk out the door not telling me what about it was good. Just a little suspicious, okay? <laughs> and they go up to Jesus, that was a great sermon. What did it mean, right? And so conveniently for us, this is one of the parables where Jesus tells us, here's exactly what it means. So there's two themes that we wanna see here, all right, that we, we need to understand to understand the parable and the explanation. So in this story, the seed that the sower is casting out into the world and into the fields and the soil represents the word of God, the word of the kingdom, the scriptures, the gospel, however you wanna phrase that in your mind, but it's the gospel message of Jesus Christ coming to earth to redeem sinners through his death and resurrection. And the soil represents our hearts. So the soil in this parable, Jesus casts the seed, the sower casts the seed of the word of God into the hearts of the hearers, and some respond with faith and fruitfulness. Some respond by totally rejecting it. Some respond by believing for a little while. Some respond and believe when it's convenient to believe, but don't believe when it's inconvenient to believe. In Romans chapter 10, verse 10, Paul says, it's with the heart that one believes and is justified. So we know based on what the rest of scripture teaches us that the soil here represents our hearts. And so Jesus tells the story, the sower goes out and he casts the seed, the word of God, into all kinds of places. First principle is, guess what the sower doesn't do? Only pick the good soil. Any of you into plants and gardening and vegetables and all of that? I'm into killing them. That's all I'm good at. Like, it just, look, at, look what I did. I wasted money. All right. <laughs> but tend to, when you do this, what do you do? Anybody that's good at this stuff, what's the first thing you do? Get good soil, right? Because you don't want to do what? Waste the seed. So one of the first things that you need to see in this parable is the sower goes out and is kind of a really bad gardener. Because what does he do with the seed? He throws it everywhere. Jesus is like, look at all the soil. There's good soil, there's thorny soil, there's shallow, rocky soil. There's a path. We're throwing it into the pavement of the street. And he's like, I'm just gonna throw the seed everywhere. And why does he do this? Because Jesus wants to see the seed planted and grow in everybody. There's not a single person he doesn't want to see come to faith. In 2 Timothy, Paul even says, it's the will of God to see all people 
come to a knowledge of and faith in the truth of Jesus Christ. All people includes the good soil and the bad soil. So what I wanna do this morning with these principles in mind that the seed is the word of God, the soil is the hearts of people, and that the sower doesn't have any bias or favoritism, okay? It is, we're casting the seed everywhere in the hopes of what? It will grow. And we're also planting in the hopes that the soil itself will miraculously change. Okay, so if you turn in your Bible to Matthew 13, we're gonna go right to verse 18 where Jesus explains the parable to us. So he says in verse 18, hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So the first soil, the, the path, what is their problem? The devil has blinded them. The, the devil snatches it away, right? And, and earlier in the parable, Jesus says, the metaphor is, the birds come and, and take the seed away. Now, just think about this. If you were a gardener and you were planting seed and trying to grow some crops, and a bunch of birds came and stole the seed before it took root, what would you do as the gardener? You would probably plant more seed to try again, right? That would be your goal. You're like, my goal is to grow these plants. It got stolen away, so guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna try again because I still want what? To grow the plants, to plant the seed. And so often, what we're gonna see with these first three types of soil, our temptation as human beings is to give up with the sharing of the gospel. Well, I, I threw the seed out there, and oh, the devil tricked them, blinded them. They had no interest in it. They didn't even want to hear the word of God. They didn't want to hear about Jesus. They didn't want to have a spiritual conversation at all. And so what do we do? What's the temptation? The easy way out is to just, I'm just not going to cast any more seed there. I'm going to go and do what? I'm going to go find some good soil, and that will be the only place that I cast the seed, the gospel out because there I know it's guaranteed to work. But I, I, I love the description that Jesus gives here. It's the evil one that comes and takes it. It's not that the person is not worth it, that the soil isn't worth it. It's what happened. The devil blinded them. The devil came in and stole the word from them so they didn't take root. Yet what did Jesus do? He still threw the seed on that pathway. All right, this um, is what was sown along the path. Verse 20, as for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but endures for a while, and then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. This, this person, they believe, right? They receive it with what? Joy. Right, we could learn a lesson from them as Lutherans sometimes. There's joy in believing and following the Lord. And so they receive it with joy, they're excited, right? Have you ever met a new Christian? They are, like we have the expression, they're on fire for Christ, they're just ready to take the world. And then there's tribulation and persecution and there's difficulties because they believe in Jesus and it's not going as smoothly as they thought it would and guess what happens? It's no longer convenient to believe in Jesus or to follow him fully. So what do I do, according to the parable? I begin to wither, fade away. I don't, have a, I don't have a deep root in Christ. I have a deep root in when he's convenient for me. So when I was a kid, the first concert my mom ever took me to, I was in fifth grade, was a DC Talk concert because Billy Graham was doing Crusade and they were the opening act. And so I didn't care about Billy Graham at the time. I love him now, okay, don't judge me. But as a fifth grader, I was like, I don't care about him. But DC Talk, that's gonna be awesome for all of you 90s babies, get excited, all right? And so while we were at the concert, I got a T-shirt because their album at the time was uh, Jesus Freak. It was like the super famous popular song at the time. And I wore that into my public middle school the next year with so much pride until people started making fun of me for it and asking me, oh, so it, like, are you a Jesus freak? Do you really believe in Jesus? 
And I gotta tell you, I was so embarrassed, so overwhelmed, that I just said, nope, and never wore the shirt again. Now you can judge my little fifth grade heart all you want, okay? <laughs> but that's what's happening here. So much joy, right? So much excitement for Jesus. I'll buy the T-shirt, and then you wear it out in public, and guess what? Not everybody likes you. It's not convenient anymore, so what do you do? You don't have any roots, and you fade away. Now, here's the deal. Going back, Jesus is telling this analogy with gardening. If the roots are struggling, if they aren't going deep enough, what would you do? You would help them along. You would give them more soil. You would give them more time, more care. And the temptation for us as Christians, again, just like with the first one, is to give up. Satan wants us to give up on scattering the seed. He doesn't want you sharing the gospel. He doesn't want us spreading the good news to all people. So we see someone that falls away, and the temptation can be like, oh, well, they didn't really believe in the first place. Oh, they're, they're weak in their faith. They're hypocrites. They're no good. They'll never stand for anything. And yet, if you had a plant like that, you would show it patience and kindness and help it along and help it find its roots so it would be stable. All right, and then he goes on into the third one in verse 1, to as for what was sown among thorns... This is the one who hears the word, so receives the word. But the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches or wealth choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So here's the key. It says, the word took root, and the plant grew, but it grew amongst the thorns. Right, so if you ever tried to grow a plant with weeds around it, and all of a sudden the weeds win all the time, no matter what you do, and how frustrating that could be. That's what Jesus said. The weeds and the thorn choke out the root and the life of this plant. It had the word. It was growing. It looked healthy, but it was unfruitful. And why was it unfruitful? Because the world and what it offers looked more beautiful to them than Jesus. Jesus said, I'm offering you this. And they said, I'd rather have what the world offers. I know it says the word riches, but it, it really means just wealth, the things, material things of the world in the Greek. So before you go, I'm not tempted by money, congratulations, that's good for you. But we are all tempted by the things of the world, things that make life more convenient, easier, help us grow in our relationships or help us advance in, the, in income, advance in our business or whatever it might be. And so it proved unfruitful because instead of being a, the plant, the seed that grew up and lived for the kingdom of God to produce fruit for his gospel, what did this plant do? It was choked out by the weeds and the thorns. It chose to say, I'm gonna grow the kingdom of the world rather than the kingdom of God. Right? And we would call this hypocrisy. Anybody like hypocrites? Anybody enjoy knowing one, interacting with them? Right? Uh, the Greek word hypocrinomai um, comes from Greek theater. And anybody that walked on stage and wore a mask was called a hypocrite because you were pretending with the mask to be something you really weren't. You were acting in front of the crowd for their applause and for their, right? And so this is kind of the hypocrite as a Christian, which let's be honest, there are times where we are all guilty of being hypocrites in our following of Jesus. We say one thing, we'll agree with the servant, we'll agree with what Jesus says in his word, and then we will go out and live what? Amongst the thorns. He said, I'd rather live for these than Christ. And what this person needs is not to be just cut off and say, well, you're a wasted seed. You're a wasted soil. They just need to be told, you could repent. You can turn back to Jesus. You can have all of your sins forgiven. And what Jesus is offering you in an eternal life is so much better than the thorns. The thorns are convenient for now. They grow really fast. But what Jesus offers you lasts forever. All right, so here are the big two themes of this parable. Repentance and evangelism. Repentance and the fact that sometimes in life, we're kind of swapping soils one through three. Sometimes I have no interest in the things of God. Sometimes it could be that 
were growing in the thorns, they're like, I, I think the thorns and the conveniences and the wealth of the world are so much better than Jesus, that's what I'm gonna chase after with my life, and I'm gonna prove to be, as Jesus said, unfruitful. Sometimes it's, I got a little bit of joy, but when, when the pressure's on, when it's inconvenient, when, when my life is being threatened or pressured in any way because of Jesus, I'm gonna back away and, and take off the Jesus Freak T-shirt. So the reality is, well, how do we change soil? How do we become, because there's only one good soil in this story. We haven't gotten there yet. There's one good soil. How do we become the soil that receives the word of God and is fruitful in the sharing of the gospel and seeing more and more seeds and more and more Christians come into the kingdom of God? And the answer is repentance, right? The 95 Theses, Lutherans, we love to bring it up. No one ever reads them, but the first one, anyway, I've read that one, says that when Jesus bids a man to come and die and to repent, he means it for the whole Christian life. Our whole lives are meant to be one of repentance. Turning away from the bad soil in my heart towards the good soil of Jesus and what he gives to me in his grace and mercy. So that's, that's the first theme, repentance. The second theme is evangelism. And this is what makes the good soil the good soil. It says, verse 23, as for what was sown in the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in one case or another case 60, and in another 30. Right? The good soil proves to be good soil because they become a sower. They become fruitful. I, I'm, I'm gonna cast the seed of the gospel wherever Jesus tells me in my life. And I'm gonna follow the example of Jesus by saying, I'm not going to keep the gospel from a certain person or certain people. I'm not gonna go, well, it's just a waste of time because they're the bad soil. They're the rocky soil. They're the thorny soil. Because what did Jesus do in your life? Well, you were still a sinner. Christ died for you. While you were not good soil, what did Jesus do for you? He, he died for you and gave you the gospel, and he turned you into good soil. In fact, um, the soil is our hearts. In Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, God speaks and says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from your heart a heart of stone and give into you a heart of flesh. He said, I'm, gonna, I'm the one that makes you into the good soil. I'm the one that takes your bad soil. I'm the one that takes your bad heart and renews it and gives you a whole new one where the gospel takes root and you have faith in Jesus and what he has done. And then he calls us, he says, here's the result of being a good soil. You are fruitful in casting out your seed and sharing the gospel so more and more people will believe in him. And what I love is at the end when he's like, in some cases, 100-fold, in some cases, 60, in some 30, right? So it's all different. Right? Some people, God's gonna use them. And like Billy Graham, <laughs> thousands upon thousands of people will do what? Come to faith through their sharing of the gospel. And then Jesus is like, well, sometimes it's, just, it's 100-fold. Sometimes it's 60, sometimes it's 30. Meaning what? He's trying to encourage us to not give up in sharing the gospel, of sowing the seed of the word of God. Because he's like, look, I'm the God who changes the soil, and I'm the God that promises it's 100, it's 60, it's 30, maybe it's just one, but it still matters, right? Because what Jesus is talking about here, and what we're talking about here, is things of eternal impact, things that last forever, humans, one of my professors at seminary used to say, I never met a mortal. What he meant by that is everybody lives forever. Every single person you meet will last forever. It's just whether they last forever with Jesus in his kingdom or outside of his kingdom. So Jesus is telling you, I want you to be the good soil that is fruitful, and sometimes I will use your life to be fruitful up to 100-fold. Sometimes it'll be 30 Maybe it'll be one, but that one will still matter for all eternity. I'm gonna tell you a story about a man named John Harper. He was a Scottish um, preacher.
preacher. He preached also here at the uh, Moody Bible Institute, Moody Church in the Midwest, but then he was also a preacher in Scotland, his homeland, and one day he was making a journey back from Scotland to America, and he decided to set sail on the Titanic. And as he was sailing on the Titanic in April of 1912, it hit the iceberg, and the story everybody knows, it began to sink, and most people died from it. So what John Harper did is he wrapped his daughter in a blanket, put her on a lifeboat, and she ended up surviving, and he stayed on the deck helping other people. And as everybody was shouting, right, one of the most common shouts on the deck was, women and children into the lifeboats first. But John Harper shouted something differently. He shouted, women and children and the unsaved into the lifeboats. Because he knew believers were ready to die. They had faith in Jesus, and if they died, guess what would happen to them? Eternity with Christ. And so John Harper ran around the deck of the Titanic shouting over and over and over again, women and children and the unsaved into lifeboats. He also asked the Titanic's orchestra to play Nearer My God to Thee. Nearer My God to Thee. Then he gathered a bunch of people around him and the descriptions that survivors say about him, it says that with holy joy in his face, he raised his arms in prayer for the unsaved. I love that phrase, holy joy. He knows I'm probably gonna die, but before I die, I'm gonna plant some more seeds. And then he gathered those people, he prayed for them. As the ship began to sink, he jumped into the icy waters and swam frantically to all that he could reach, beseeching them to turn to the Lord Jesus and be saved. So as the boat's going down, he jumps into the water and he swims from person to person, everybody that he can reach, and he begins asking them, are you saved? Do you believe in Jesus? Right? Now, just think about your frame of mind if you're on the Titanic and it's going down and you jump into the Ion Harper's mind was, well, I still have a little time left to sow some seeds to keep sharing the gospel. So he swims around asking people, do you believe in the Lord Jesus? And asking them to be saved by believing in him. And then John Harper eventually sank into the depths and passed in the Lord's presence. He was 39 years old. See, the the encouragement of this parable is to be the good soil. What it looks like to be the good soil has nothing to do with your morality, has nothing to do with your ability or my ability to play church, do the right things, say the right things, know all the ups and downs of it all. Jesus says, no, the good soil is the soil that produces fruit by sharing the gospel and planting it in any soil that it sees. I love that part of the story. The sower, Jesus, looks at all the soil and he says, some of it's good, most of it's bad, but guess what he does? He plants the gospel in every soil. He offers the gospel to every heart. And while we were still sinners, while we were still all messed up, terrible, stone-hearted, bad, rocky soil, he died for us gave us new hearts, and redeemed us. So he says, keep going. Sometimes it's gonna be 100 fold, sometimes it's gonna be 60 fold or 30 fold, sometimes it'll just be one person, but that eternity matters. And so he says, be the good soil that yields fruit. Here's the other thing. God wants you to keep planting the seeds of the gospel and Satan wants you to shut up. He does. Whatever thorns, whatever temptations, whatever tribulations come along, Satan's goal is for you and I to keep the gospel to ourselves and say, I will not share it with anybody. I will be silent. And Jesus says, no, but I want you to share it with everybody and anybody. And I think one of the ways that Satan really convinces us to be quiet and to be silent about it is that sometimes we don't see the seed take root and become a plant. Sometimes we share the gospel and we feel like, well, what difference did it make? When am I gonna see that, that yield on the crops that Jesus talks about of 100, a 64, or 30 fold, right? Sometimes we share the gospel and we have no idea, did it take root? Did it make a difference in their lives? And so what was the temptation that Satan wants to trick us with? 
It doesn't, whatever you're doing doesn't make a difference, just give up. And Jesus says, no, 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 it, it will make a difference, right? Our Old Testament reading, Isaiah 55, he says, my re- word doesn't return empty or void. It accomplishes its goal, and its goal is to create faith, as Paul says in Romans 10, in the person's heart. And so I want to encourage you, and I think Jesus would encourage you through this parable to keep sharing the gospel, even if you don't end up being the one that reaps the harvest. Even if you and I don't end up being the one that sees the difference that it makes. So there's another part to the story of John Harper. At 39, he sinks into the sea and goes into the presence of the Lord. Yet four years later, a young Scotsman named Aguila Webb stood up in a meeting, a church meeting in Hamilton, Canada, and gave the following testimony. He said, I am a survivor of the Titanic. When I was drifting alone on a piece of rubble that awful night, the tide brought a Mr. John Harper of Glasgow, also on a piece of wreck, near me. Man, he said, are you saved? No, I said, I am not. He replied, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The waves bore him away, but strangely later that night brought him back. And he said, are you saved now? (laughs) No, I said, I cannot honestly say that I am saved. He said again, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And shortly after he went down and there alone in the night with the two miles of water under me, I believed. And then he closed his testimony with saying, I am John Harper's last convert. See, Jesus is like, Plant the seed, guys. Sometimes you're going to see it. John Harper never learned this story. He didn't know that Aguila believed. He said, I'm going to plant the seed. I'm going to keep asking. I'm going to tell you about Jesus. And then John Harper sank into the Atlantic. And four years later, Aguila was like, here's my story. I heard the gospel from a man named John Harper, and I believe in Jesus. Sometimes you will get to see the seed take root and grow into a plant. You're like, wow, it's beautiful and amazing. Other times, it'll be four years later, 10 years later, decades later. Sometimes it'll be in heaven. You go, oh, you're here now. That's so great. So again, here's the words of Jesus. As for what was sown on good soil, This is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case, a hundredfold, in another 60, and another 30. Dear friends, be good soil. Plant the seed of the gospel wherever you are in life, in whatever hearts Jesus brings into your life. Knowing that what he promises in Isaiah 55 is true, his word does not return empty. It accomplishes its task of creating faith in people's hearts. And even when you feel like giving up, remember the words of Ezekiel chapter 36. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove from your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Your God is in the business of changing the soil and changing the heart and the lives of people around you. And he uses you and me and our sharing the gospel to do it. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you loved us, went to the cross to forgive us, redeem us when we were rocky, terrible, unfit soil, that you changed our hearts of stone into a heart of flesh, and you created and planted in us the gospel so that we would have faith in you. Holy Spirit, turn us into good soil so that we may be fruitful and sharing the gospel that you have given to us so that more and more people may say, I now believe in Jesus Christ. In your name we pray, amen.